this afternoon is all these ideas that we're having, how much they're rotating through my mind and being applied to the population that I know, mental models. We have a mental model of the poor, and a big part of that mental model is that we think, oh my goodness, this $2 a day, how on earth can people live on $2 a day? And we think to ourselves, well, what do I spend $2 on? I spend it on Starbucks. It gets me a Metro card uptown in New York, a little bit less here. And you can download something from iTunes. So how can people possibly live on $2 a day? Well, let me tell you. I mean, not only do they live on $2 a day, but they do quite well. They manage money because, very carefully, because they have so little of it. And that's one of the things that I'm here to talk to you today. We have a mental model of poor households. Either we see them as victims and sort of limping along, or we see them as heroes, able to reach tall buildings in a single bound without Nathan's machine. But neither is really true. They're quite a bit like us, and frankly, they manage their money a lot more like we do than we might think. My co-authors and I, we discovered through talking to poor households over the course of the year that some of our assumptions about how poor people live are not necessarily true. We make some assumptions that surely people only live hand to mouth. We assume that people can't plan for the future and we assume that surely they can't play, they can't save. When I did a lot of this research, I was a finance lecturer at the University of Cape Town, and I was surrounded by people who were doing what I used to do, thinking about the stock market and thinking about the bond market. And they said, well, if you're trying to study now how poor people manage their money, that's easy because they don't have any. I found the exact opposite to be true. We did this thing where we said, all right, we're going to look at these households day in, day out, and we're going to track every single bit of money that comes in and every bit of money that goes out. We're going to run what we call financial diaries. Now, this isn't having households sit down and write down everything that they spend and what they have. Frankly, that's way too boring. And households would never, ever, ever keep up with that. No, rather, we, we tracked people. We interviewed them every other week for a year, an entire year. It was agonizing, frankly. It was a huge amount of work. We had teams of field workers seeing them every other week. We did this in South Africa, Bangladesh, and India. My personal experiences in South Africa where I lived for about a decade, um, where I'd worked as a portfolio manager. But I found that, boy, what am I doing here? I'm not really that interested and how the wealthy manage their money. I want to see how the people on those shacks by the side of the road, what are they doing? How are they managing? How do they manage during all the things that they come up against? Now, you might say, well, why on earth would you track them over time? Well, the way that we usually do this type of thing, the way that we usually try to understand the behaviors of the poor is that we do this big survey on them. And we would come up with numbers that look sort of like up here on this side of the screen. But you'll notice that you can't really see anything. You say, well, what's behind that? What's, what's going on? And you know, the thing about finance is, finance by definition is the relationship between time and money. And in order to truly understand finances, you need to observe them both at the same time. So we needed to watch the money go through people's lives. Now, we could have done that by getting very, very close to a few households. But you know, we really wanted to have that be, we wanted to talk to different types of households. And so we did these financial diaries as something of a mixed method. Now, some of the lessons that we learned was first, poor people do manage their money and they manage their money very actively. We found that at, people had at least four different financial instruments, and most people had 10 different financial instruments. And as a portfolio manager in the past, I naturally, this got me thinking, and I thought, well, this is a portfolio that they're managing, frankly. They're managing different financial instruments across different needs. And they're not just stuck in informal financial tools. They don't just stick money into the mattress. They don't just borrow from the evil money lender. No, some of them have bank accounts, but they're still saving in informal savings groups. 
So they're not in one sector of the economy or the other, but they blend it. Now that's a lesson beyond the finances of the poor, but really how to understand poverty. That poverty doesn't necessarily trap you behind a wall, but that wall has perforations. And there are some aspects of your life that you do in the formal world and some aspects of your life that you do in the informal world. This is an example of a household that my colleague Stuart Rutherford interviewed in Bangladesh. This is Hamid in Khadija. Now Hamid is a rickshaw driver, not a motorized rickshaw driver, the one where you use your legs. So he could only really work for about four days a week. That's all you can really take. His wife, Khadija, takes in sewing and they live with their three children in this, this sort of shack in the Dhaka slums. Now, if you were to interview them just once with a survey, you, they'd probably tell you, oh, sure, I have a savings account, and oh, yeah, I have one of those microfinance loans, because we've all heard of Grameen Bank, we've all heard of Yunus. They'd say, yes, 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 that's right. Yes, we do have one of those. We can tell you that. We do have life insurance. But, you know, they wouldn't tell you about a whole bunch of other things that they use. Here's a few other things that they do that Stuart discovered after talking to them for about a year. Here's all the different ways that they manage their money. One thing that might look a little bit strange over there, saving with a money guard. What the heck is a money guard? Well, that's when if you have a big chunk of money, you give it to someone and you say, here, keep this. Don't let me spend it. Sometimes you find women say, here, you guard this money for me and I'll guard that money for you. So that if their husbands come along and say, you know what, I need a certain amount of money and I need to go out with the boys. They say, oh no, I don't have anything. Oh, it's so-and-so's money. And that was a way of keeping that money away from all the different types of expenditure that are right in front of your face every single day. It was a way of keeping that money aside. And by the way, these are all the different savings instruments. Sometimes we think that the poor only need credit. Surely they only need to borrow money. But no, they need savings instruments. And here are the different ways that they save. So the second thing that we found is that, you know, being poor isn't just about low incomes. We know that by definition. But more importantly, it's all about the income being irregular. You know, somebody popped out out of the ground and said, oh, here's your $2 for today. Frankly, life would be much easier because you'd have a regularity, you'd have a predictability. But what we found is that in the lives of people who have low incomes, their lives are very unpredictable. On top of that, on top of that irregular and unpredictable income, people also have financial tools that are not particularly well suited to what they're trying to do. So we call that the triple whammy. In other words, these financial tools, they didn't really match when you only sort of got $5 one day and nothing for the next couple days. People really couldn't move that money over time very easily given the tools that they have. So let me tell you about this lady here. This is Pumza, a woman that I got to know very, very well in South Africa. She lived in a township outside of Cape Town. She's very intimidating, frankly. Every time I went to see her, she would say, oh, you're getting fat. <laughs> and I say, yes, Ms. Pumza. Can you tell me about what money you spent last week? <laughs> she used to sell sheep intestines. Now that is not part of Nathan's throat, but that's sheep intestines. She would sell them on the side of the road, and that's how she would support herself and four other people in the household. She actually was doing pretty well. She was above that $2 a day mark. But here's the challenge. Her net cash flows from her business looked like this. See, jagged line. Here's her, it's actually about $20 a month <coughs> on the whole. That really isn't too bad if you look at that $20 a month. The problem is managing that jaggedness, especially when that dips very low. I mean, what do you do if you're actually selling at a loss and you can't buy new, and ship, new sheep intestines for the next day? Because I mean, people like them fresh. You can't sell old sheep intestines, no. So she would borrow from the money lender and she also had a savings club that she was able to get more money and be able to sell fresh and cheap sheep intestines. So here's the challenge. The challenge is not the $2 a day. The challenge is that it's coming 
on this very irregular basis, and you never know both when the money is coming in, and you know what? You never know when the money's going to have to go out either. Now, you would think that if the poor face all these circumstances, these challenges, that surely the, mu the money must just roll right through their fingers. How can you possibly save if you have money coming in unpredictably and you have these low incomes? But we found that poor people actually did save quite a bit. Astoundingly, in South Africa, on average, the households that I talked to saved 21% of income. 21% of income. Who saves that much? Who does that? I don't do that. I don't do that. My father, who's sitting in the back row, from whom I learned my money management skills, probably does save 21% of income, but he's very unusual. These guys, this is across the sample. The way they did it was through informal financial mechanisms, through savings clubs. They would get together and they would save together. I'll show you a picture in a moment. Now, the thing is that that mechanism works brilliantly. I mean, you get that 21% of income set aside. The problem is that these savings clubs fail. People take the money away, or they're very inflexible. They don't necessarily, you can't get the money when you need it. It's not necessarily the perfect solution. So here's how a savings club works. This is Numsa. She's in a rural area of South Africa, and she looks after four grandchildren. She had three children, and two of them have passed away from HIV AIDS. But still, she managed to set aside $40 out of every 120 that she received in welfare from the government every month. $40 out of 120. She used two of these things. She had a group of friends who would get together, and every month they would each contribute $9. Now, the secretary would take it and put it home under the mattress, which was, which was a little bit scary. A lot of times, these savings groups, they might put it in the bank, they might put the money in the bank, or they might lend it out. Do you know what interest rate they would charge? 30% per month. Now, that's typical township interest rates. And you might say, oh my god, you're kidding. This is horrible. Frankly, that's what money lenders lend out as. And we found that when people were taking loans in the townships, and they would say, yes, I took a loan. Ah, I took it from a machinista. Oftentimes, that money lender, that machinista, were the really nice ladies who were just trying to save. So you have to sometimes be careful of that type of mental model. The reason why NUMSA would do this is because at the end of the year, exactly in time when she needed to pay school fees and when they needed to do some things with the house to keep it in reasonably good shape, it would spit out $100. And she'd be able to use that just in time. The problem is that she'd never be able to make that last beyond a year. By definition, this has to be very, very rigid. People have to be able to take that income and put it directly to what they need. This reminds me of this, the discussion that we had later on this afternoon around education, around filling in financial aid forms. You need to be right there. You need to be right there when the money comes out in order to get it where it needs to go. There is time matters and timing matters in the lives of the poor and managing their lives. So this is an, an example <coughs> of the type of catastrophes that people face, risks that people face constantly through their lives. This happens to be a fire that raged through one of the townships that I was working in that, in fact, Pumza lives quite close to. We found that oftentimes people were facing death, illness, and very importantly in South Africa, funerals. Funerals are incredibly important. And they're very expensive. People spend about seven months of income on them. And because of the high rate of HIV AIDS, they're happening all the time. The thing about dealing with risks in the lives of poor people is that you need that money right then and there when that risk comes up. Here's what happens if you don't have the money right there. This is Faisal. He's from a rural area of India. He is um, an itinerant pot salesman. You can see his pots right over here, and he walks around and sells them. The household income on a monthly basis is about $36. He supports um, three children on the basis of that. One of the most important things about Faisal is that, three, is that the three children that still are in his home are all girls. 
he needs to pay a dowry in order to get them out of his house. And he has been saving like crazy to save up a dowry for the oldest one. There's no way he's going to touch that money even when he breaks his leg. Now he breaks his leg, he has no insurance, he's got this pocket of money for the dowry, but he doesn't want to use it because he's got to get this girl out of here. He delays treatment. He ends up going to a traditional doctor and he loses eight months of wages because he didn't have a pot of savings set up that was labeled just in case I fall sick and I need a doctor. The total treatment cost ends up being incredibly expensive and the only reason why he can go and get his leg fixed is because his estranged father steps in and says, look, I have to take you to the city and I'm going to set you up in a hospital. He ended up really draining all of his finances because he postponed seeing the doctor, because he didn't have that savings set aside. And this is the type of choice that the poor faced all the time. This type of risk is crucial. So the last point that I want to talk through, we've all heard about Grameen Bank and microfinance, and we've heard that making loans to poor households can sometimes lift them out of poverty. I found that yes, that can happen. <laughs> but poor households need far more than just capital loans. And in fact, sometimes it can really get them into trouble. You know, a lot of times when people take microcredit loans, they use it for some other purpose. You know, the child is sick, they need to pay school fees, what have you. The big problem with that is that you've got this big whopping loan, say for $1,000, all you need is 200. And let's say that you could take that 200 loan and you could pay it back within a month or two. Frankly, when people take money lender loans, they pay it back really quick. If you take a microfinance loan, you take a much larger loan and you need to pay it back over six months. So now you've got a very wrong size to the problem that people actually have. And people need to manage that $1,000 when all they really needed was 200. We find that people need bridging finance, they need savings accounts, they need insurance. They don't always just need a big capital loan to expand their business, and pretty rarely will they use it to do that. So we're not thinking necessarily as hard as we could about the poor and their money. Our mental models are pretty flawed, and in many ways, those mental models are actually creating, in some ways, more problems for the poor than necessarily they need to. The hidden, val well, the hidden problem and the hidden tragedy of poverty is not really that $2 a day and how low the $2 is. It's really that the poor don't have the right tools to help them manage what they have. And that hurts them doubly because not only do they continue to be vulnerable, but they're not necessarily able to use the innovation and the ingenuity that they have. Thanks very much.